architect, and I came back to um, Toronto about uh, five years ago with a bit of apprehension about what I was coming back to, in part because I think before I left, uh, the, the idea that there was an established design environment here was um, maybe more an imagination than something that was a reality. And uh, one of the things that I came across was that the idea that <clears throat> since coming back, I've seen so many different kinds of formats of collaborations, including with this guy. And some people might know this person. Uh, this is Nadir Elevet, and until recently, he ran a bike shop on Harvard called Le Carrera Cycles. He was on the phone, and he was preparing a bid to produce um, an event called the Courier Messenger World Championship. And uh, I was ready to take on a different project, so I offered to help him build a velodrome for this event that was going to happen in Guatemala. Uh, how to actually build a velodrome, of course, is a big question. And uh, one of the things I started to do is figure out who would, who would you talk to about building such a thing. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing you do is a bit of research and uh, trying to figure out exactly what constitutes a velodrome and what this event would be. Because uh, Guatemala, of course, is a place I've never been to. And every one of these tracks is a slightly different thing. So the one on the right is one that I saw in Cuba. The one on the left is another one that I went and saw in Berlin. And if you've ever been to London, Ontario, the smallest track in the world is actually there built in a former ice rink. Um, <clears throat> turns out that a former professor of mine, a landscape architect, had actually built one of these velodrome tracks. And it was called the Human Powered Roller Coaster. It was this tiny little track that was a figure eight. And this became a kind of a launching point for the possibility of what we would do uh, together as a collaboration. So again, the kind of question of how do you build something in a place that is essentially a small little village where uh, the best way to get around is usually by a cart or a donkey or a walking or a bicycle. And the one road that goes through Panayachal is usually uh, swamped out by uh, some kind of a flood or disaster. So <clears throat> the uh, process began by uh, talking to different people. And the first person we talked to uh, was this mathematician at the Fields Institute whose uh, specialization was knot theory. So he developed uh, an algorithm for each one of these knots that you're seeing here on the screen. And that there is actually a mathematical equation that figures this out is kind of bewildering. But it allowed us to kind of discover what the geometry of a track might be. So uh, this is an early image of what that track starts to look like. And one of the kind of challenges of having a track like this is <clears throat> where do you want someone's attention to be on the actual geometry or on just winning this race? So we created this track in such a way that um, you could maintain a constant velocity of about 65 kilometers an hour, which is what a, a professional velodrome track would normally be. The track length is about 200 kilometers, so five laps constitutes one, uh, uh, one kilometer, so effectively that's the, the, the length of the ride. And all of this geometry is basically used to work out how do you make a figure eight track work out so that it swoops and, and curves and, and, and the track driver is going full tilt. Um, and basically looking over his shoulder against uh, his competition can just focus on going as fast as they go and they don't have to think about leaning or turning or anything like that. The curve basically does that for you. So this is one of the moments that's the trickiest, of course, the crossover point. <clears throat> and when this thing started to get a little bit of attention, uh, it got quite a bit of press, including uh, some people in London. This is uh, from an article in Boneshaker magazine in the UK. Um, we got some calls from people in Berlin, in Gothenburg, Sweden, and uh, there's apparently some discussion about um, possibly doing something for the Pan Am Games in Milton. Um, one of the other challenges that we faced was how do you build this thing in the context like Pan NHL, as I mentioned, and uh, we had to do this as an outdoor track. So the idea of doing a uh, track as wood, which is normally how these things are done, just simply wasn't an option in this place. The, the kind of skill and craftsmanship uh, didn't exist for the kind of sophistication that we were after. So we looked at an old soccer pitch that was next to a river, and uh, part of the river had been washed out in the flood about a couple weeks earlier. So um, <clears throat> the, the soccer pitch was available, and we looked at a rammed structure, basically piling up the dirt, basically how they build the, uh, the, a lot of the in their own right, uh, produces the track that we end up with. So um, <clears throat> this is a further article from the event. And it just so happened that uh, before the event could actually take place, the city was hit by a flood, a hurricane, a volcano erupted, and a landslide took out most of the city. Uh, that was all, <laughs> that was a lot of fun to deal with right then. This was the next event I was a part of, not the fire, but uh, the night before we had um, organized a furniture festival, made it. 
and uh, I had installed a light fixture. And then the next morning I heard that there was a fire, and I was, of course, worried that my light fixture had burned down the entire city, and uh, <laughs> uh, Duke Cycle was the victim of that one. I'm pretty sure people have seen that site now. Uh, but one of the things we got to do then was um, <clears throat> meet a kind of different group of people that were uh, basically young designers design developing furniture. And you might have seen a couple of these events in the last uh, few weeks, actually, uh, made uh, as part of that group. Or um, uh, it was an uh, event just down the street um, by a group called Associates that we were part of. And uh, the year before was an event called Tools at one of the events. And basically what's happening here is a kind of an opportunity for designers to uh, find uh, their own kind of voice and, and establish a relationship with local galleries and find a way to show their works to people that wouldn't otherwise get to see it because the support base isn't there until you become self-organized. So um, these are basically recent projects that uh, were a part of that kind of collaboration process. And it's made coming back to Toronto, I think, uh, a lot more exciting because the uh, sky's the limit in terms of the opportunities when you collaborate like this. So uh, that's, that's it. <laughs>